If there's such thing as a player's coach within the world of watches, it's Adam Golden. He's straightforward, honest, and he can either chop it up with you or get straight to business, which I really appreciate. We chat about everything from his recent pieces bought to sell, his approach to selling them, and he's very candid about his margins and processes, which shouldn't be taken for granted. This one went quick for me, which is usually a telltale sign a conversation is engaging, so I hope you feel the same. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Good to see you, man. You too, brother. It's uh, it's been a long time in the in the making. Obviously, I missed you. I guess your last LA trip. I don't even know what month that was, um, dude. I was I was in California like three times <laughs> over the summer, but like for like a period of like twenty four to forty eight hours max, and like then out, and it was miserable. So I never want to do that again. Well, when you do these trips, is it to like deliver a watch that's like crazy pricey or like what? It's what? it's all over the place. Sometimes deliver a watch that's crazy pricey. And a lot of these deals, even though I can ship it like Malkart or whatever, sometimes if somebody's buying something like big and heavy, like it's better to have like delivering person where they get to meet you, ask questions, whatever. Yeah. Um, but over the summer, it was just like random stuff. Like I was passing through on my way to Japan once, uh, came through once for, fuck, I don't remember random shit so yeah. one of one of them one of them was watch related uh one of them was a uh, uh comic-con and then i had to leave early to uh so yeah it was in la uh but i had to leave early to go deliver jay-z a watch like last minute so i was supposed to stay there a few days and within like four hours of being there i was like oh gotta change my flight you know yeah. uh so shit like that so and feel free to be like i'd rather not talk about this if i ever ask you a question that you don't want to talk about where does one meet Jay Z to deliver a watch? Is it his house? Is it a restaurant? Is it no? Is his office at Rock Nation? Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, we're not that we're not that close yet that I could uh, maybe get the house invite. Maybe one day. Right. Sure. Because uh, I think Ben got him the Sky Dweller, according to I, I think it was when the Sky Dweller came out. I think Ben kind of like dude. It's wild because like guy like that, he has some. AD connects like I know he does with AP and stuff like that sure. but other brands he does it like some heavy hitter modern Patek that he's gotten like not from Patek you know it's wild does he get them second hand then or like through you like great great market not, not through me through through somebody else through this okay. uh, guy guy named Alex Alex Todd and that's actually how I got introduced to him was through he has like a, a watch guy uh, who actually deals with a lot of people in like Jay Z's orbit? So he deals with all the Rock Nation artists, deals with comedians like Kevin Hart, all these guys. Um, and he's known Jay Z for a while now, like over ten years, and he helps him get watches, etc. Uh, really fantastic guy. And so Jay Z started getting interested in some vintage stuff. Um, so he was recommended, and he saw some of my YouTube videos, and he was recommended to me as like you know a trusted guy to like make sure he's not getting screwed. Yeah. Um, I looked around for a couple gold Paul Newmans because they were like thinking about a gold Paul Newman. They were looking at one overseas that I found questionable. So I was luckily told them like, Hey, it's very expensive. And, uh, the origins are questionable. I won't get into the details of that watch just cause I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but sure. Offered him a couple other ones, uh, like a John player special and then like a normal champagne 62, 41 Paul Newman. Those didn't really stick. And then when I knew I was getting in like a very special watch, it was a 6263 Paul Newman co-signed Tiffany & Co. Uh, MK1 dial, the earliest one that's known. Um, I just, it randomly popped in my head, like, let's say, maybe, you, know, you never know, like, let's see it. And then it ended up being his birth year, which I didn't even realize. Uh, oh, wow. But I thought about him because he's a Tiffany & Co. ambassador. Uh, right. So like, hey, this might be interesting. If he was interested in a gold Newman, maybe steel, but more special would make sense. And within like minutes of me offering the watch and maybe like within within an hour of me showing alex the watch alex showing jay-z the watch like the deal was done like wow. when can you be here with the watch and i'm like well the watch isn't even in miami yet like i haven't even physically got the watch yet because <laughs> it was coming from out of the country and it was like a whole fucking thing to get it together in time to to deliver it to him because he's only like in the office for a couple days during the week and he's traveling all the time um, and since it was like his first real big vintage piece, it was something that like I had to like go and like explain and answer any questions that he might have had. And he actually didn't have a lot, you know. We'd 
kind of sew, sewed up all of, like the details beforehand. Um, yeah. So it was more of just like meeting him, you know, uh, helping him size the watch, explaining a little bit about it. Uh, really, really great guy. Like, honestly, you know, I've met uh, a, a fair bit of celebrities like through this job, you know, selling some sure. watches. And for the most part, they're OK, but there are a lot of them out there that are like. <laughs> I don't want to deal with them. Yeah. Unbearable. Um, you know, just uh, I think too much has been handed to them and they've like lost their, you know, sense of reality, you know, sure. how, like the real world operates, you know, um, he was not like that at all, like super nice, unassuming, you know, uh, down to earth, it seemed. Uh, and then we we spoke again on FaceTime when I was in Geneva talking about a, a big watch and auction he was interested in. Uh, just just nice guy, you know? Yeah. I've I've worked with my share of celebrities as well with uh within retail in Los Angeles and Malibu and and I think the common crux of the um pain in the ass part of dealing with them is that they are surrounded in an orbit of people that never tell them no. Yeah, yes, so like, exactly. Yeah, it's just like they never hear no. So when they do, they're like what the hell, man? Like and they're just like they they don't understand what no means and Anyway, it's it's kind of interesting. How often are transactions for you like, you know, because obviously you're somewhat of a middleman in, in certain cases, right? So like how often or like what percentage of transactions like fall through due to like the two parties being apart on numbers? Uh, all the time. Yeah. All the time. You know, uh, I mean, I generally don't uh, middleman a lot of stuff. I'd la- rather sell what's in my inventory because sure. I have more control control over it. It's just strictly yeah. a control thing and, you know, quality control also just, you know, making sure that one party doesn't back out. Cause there's a lot of times you could offer somebody a watch, for example, and it's like, Wesley, you want to sell your watch and I offer it to client, you know, a or whatever. And then all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I changed my mind. You know, yeah. that happens all the time too. And then you look stupid. Um, <laughs> but obviously in a lot of bigger and important watches, you know, you don't have the chance to buy it outright or the money or whatever. So you do kind of have to middleman it. Um, uh, offering another client, for example, right now, some heavy watches, like uh, way exceeding the seven figures. And like, <laughs> I wish I could say that I could stock those watches, but I can't. Right. So that's like, yeah, middleman scenario. Uh, right. But generally, I would say that's that's more the exception than the norm. Uh, most of the times I'm just trying to sell what I actually own. And of course we do a lot of sourcing sometimes too, like, uh, somebody's looking for something specific. So, you know, we try to track it down, you know, Jordan or I or whoever. Um, but yeah, most of the times uh, I'm trying to sell what I actually physically have here. Do you consider yourself being a specialist of anything in particular? Like, or like, do you focus on any sort of like decade range brand? So when I got started in the industry, I was selling uh, mostly and focusing mostly on what I loved, which was 40s and 50s chronographs. Okay. Uh, so of that specific era, um, it's obviously since evolved because you can't really, if you want to be successful and if you want to make a statement and be very active, you can't pigeonhole yourself into any one brand or era because sure. there's just not enough of it, you know? Um, so I obviously expanded out to Rolex because Rolex, there's so much of it. You know, they produce more than anybody else by by a landslide. Um, mm-hmm. So especially with respect to vintage watches, there's just more to do, more to see, more to collect. Uh, obviously, vintage Patek, vintage Omega, Vacheron, EP, et cetera. Um, I guess I, I'd like to say I hate using the word expert for anybody. Um, I would like to say that I'm very well versed in everything uh obviously i'm not too proud to say i don't know what i don't know so for example like a uh, certain vintage cartier like i only know certain models pretty well other models i might not know well I'll, I'll phone a friend you know uh i think that's where a lot of people get caught up not to digress but uh a lot of people get caught up that they're too proud to ask for help you know right. and they shouldn't be it's a very you know what collecting watches in general is very collaborative you know i started a whatsapp chat for collectors and it's like everybody just sharing ideas like everybody very positive and that's what it should be yeah but i, I like to think of myself as a specialist more on originality and condition uh of everything you know like i'm able to look at a watch uh, and I, that's really how I got started in the business because people were always coming to me for advice like, hey, is this reloomed? Is this dial refinished? What do you think? Um, and it's more of kind of like piecing together the story of the watch and understanding uh, if it was born that way, you know, what's original, what's not. Uh, so, you know, and I could, I'd like to think that I could look at pretty much mostly any watch and tell you 
uh, more or less, you know, what's been replaced, what's original, uh, what's written, what's not, you know, um, regardless of knowing the exact detail about that watch. What's on your wrist right now, given that uh, it appears to be an AP? It So I just, I literally just picked this up this morning. I thought it was very cool. So I put it on. It's a 33 millimeter uh, quartz model, but it is a Tantalum and Platinum reference 56175 uh championship watch and it has box and papers and it, just, it was just cool i, I thought it was, i like it you know i like when ap experimented with different metals uh and like did like a two-tone watch but not just necessarily steel and gold you know the right. like rose gold tantalum you know tantalum platinum you know they, they they really did a lot of cool two-tone iterations of the royal oak that no other brands were doing mm-hmm. um and still haven't done uh which i find uh, i find really cool so whenever i get one in i, I like to wear it for a little bit until it sells now, forgive my ignorance. What does championship allude to? Is that the Nick Faldo type of situation? Or? Yeah, it was. It was. I think it was something with regards to uh, a golf tournament. You know, yeah, I don't okay. remember off the top of my head. Because uh, I've heard like the old courts Royal Oak is the Nick Faldo, but then again, I also don't know. He had a Nick Faldo had a watch made just for him. There was a Nick Faldo limited edition we had one in stock it was a, okay. a rose gold like 36 millimeter watch i believe it has something to do with golf either golf or like yachting or something mm-hmm. google it real quick i'm actually sitting at my desk <laughs> <laughs> so you picked that you picked this up from a collector uh individual no or? i was i was at a trade show this morning and a japanese dealer had it and it was a, a reasonable price point and it's a watch i just hadn't had in a while Sure. Uh, I like to buy different stuff. You know, I, I we keep in stock. So like here, other stuff I got at the trade show this morning is a 5513 Submariner, uh, white gold surrounds, uh, box papers. Um, I bought two different 1680 whites, uh, Submariners, you know, just general stuff that like everybody's always looking for. But yeah. then I also found a really nice 18239 date oh, eight nice. white gold, but it has like a beautiful, I don't know if you could see it, yeah. like yellow or orange patina on the dial. So just, I like to buy a variety of stuff. I, I don't like to focus on one single model or brand or anything like that. I, I kind of like to run the gauntlet, you know, and have a little bit of everything. Uh, Cause it's like, it, it parallels my own collecting where I, I there's not, I don't think I, I don't have a huge collection because we have so much inventory. So I don't ever right. feel the need to keep too much, but I don't think there's a single brand that's repeated in my collection. Like I have two Rolex or three Rolex. I I think I just have one right now. Um, And I like to keep it, you know, variety is the spice of life kind of thing, you know? Yeah, totally. Do you know what the 33 millimeter Royal Oak championship is for? Is that for golf? Do you remember? I don't remember. Hold on. Championship edition, rare bird. Here's a website. Watch collecting life. So I should know this. It's all good. It's probably PGA Championship. Yeah, it's golf. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's interesting that yellow patina on that date. It, there was a day date, right? Day date. Yeah. Yeah. It almost looks like tiger eye. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's really really stunning. I'll send you a picture when we hang out. It's really cool. It's like a. Yeah, cool. It's like a like a burnt by the sun kind of thing. You know mm-hmm. the, that was originally silver, and now it's like completely like yellow orange. It's stunning. You know. Yeah, so cool. I, I I buy a lot sometimes just because I'm. I see the watch and I just like fall in love with it. You know, Uh, it's just very much a passion driven thing. When I started the business, I I kind of went with the uh, idea that like, I didn't want to list anything for sale that I wouldn't personally own. And I think most that still remains 90% true. Obviously we'll list certain modern watches that are just too big for me or too flashy that I personally wouldn't own, but I appreciate what they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not that, but like maybe my personal collecting tastes like don't align with that. Uh, but I like the watch, you know what I'm saying? I won't throw anything up there that I personally find like appalling or, or stupid or, or whatever, you know, or trashy condition or anything like that. I will put up watches that I wouldn't personally own, but I think they're cool watches, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of like what I do with my apparel. I mean, there's got to be some element a little bit in your world and mine where it's almost like you have to somewhat be a mind reader and like understand like what people want and or are willing to pay for. So Yeah. I mean, everything that Standard H produces, I always joke that I'm customer number one and I'm never going to produce anything that I wouldn't wear myself. But on the same note, I also have to understand that there are going to be things that like people will like, say, in a certain color that maybe I am not so stoked on. You know what I mean? So Yeah, for sure. um, Well, can you kind of back up for a second and sort of tell everybody like how you started, when you started and kind of like how it 
like where you are now kind of thing? Like just the Cliff's notes. Cause I know you were a lawyer, but like, what did you practice? So I used to work in Moscow, Russia. I was in-house counsel, in-house counsel for an oil and gas company. And that's actually when I really started getting interested in watches. I had had a, when I graduated law school, my dad gifted me his JLC Reverso Duo. Cool. Um, I really wanted a Daytona. And at the time, Daytonas were cheap. Uh, but he gave me that and it was much more meaningful anyways. Um, I saved up a little bit of money and I bought uh, a Panerai. I was actually a Panerai collector. A lot of people don't know that. I'm trying to move this down so you get less light on the top of my head anyways oh, okay. um so uh i was actually a panerai collector and when this is when panerai was like at its peak and everybody was obsessed with panerai and i would wear these huge 47 millimeter watches with like no hint of irony uh, but i saved up a little bit of money and i bought a panerai and then when i lived in moscow i saved up a little bit of money and i bought an adam rp gay royal oak offshore bumblebee okay Got it. uh two watches that if you know me now are, are not in the realm of even consideration but anyways um I started getting interested in vintage watches, started reading a lot about them. Uh, as I'd go home for vacation or holidays or whatever to visit family, I would buy, pick up something, you know, relatively inexpensive. I remember early days I had like a, a gold plated Angelus Chrono Dato, uh, triple day chronograph. I had a pink gold Ulysse Nardine chronograph from the 40s. Like I had random stuff, but nothing particularly expensive. I had a two tone date chest. That was my first Rolex. Sure. Um, and nothing particularly expensive. Uh, and then I traded, uh, the first big vintage watch I bought was a 6262 Daytona, which I traded my Bumblebee, my prized Bumblebee and a Panerai for, uh, and when I got that watch, it really all just clicked. And the other, I had a, maybe two or three other modern watches in the collection at the time. Uh, and I sold those to start focusing more on vintage, um, my last year practicing law in Russia, I was traveling back and forth between Miami and Moscow. Uh, cause my father's law firm, he does real estate, estate planning, probate, some civil litigation. Uh, and he practices with one of my best friends growing up, just the two of them, their partners. Uh, they were involved in litigation against bank of America. They were suing bank of America on behalf of a client, uh, for like a breach of contract, you know, for a mortgage, whatever. And, um, it was too much work for them to do by themselves with everything else going on in the practice, but not enough for them to really hire a third person. So a deal was struck to let me split time. So I'd spend mm -hmm. a month in Miami, a month in Moscow. I'd, I'd fly home to do motion practice, you know, go to court, do this, do that, uh, and then go back to Moscow. Um, while I was here doing that, uh, my girlfriend got pregnant. Mm -hmm. and We met in Moscow. Uh, so we made the decision to stay in Miami full time. Uh, and that was right around the time when I started taking selling watches more seriously. I was already like full-blown collector, and I was selling stuff on the side, but mostly to fund my own collection, you know, sure. like, uh, okay, let me flip this watch, make, make a thousand bucks. Cause then I could afford this watch, you know? Um, when she got pregnant was when I really, uh, take, took it seriously. I formed a company, um, within six months of doing that, I left, uh, practicing law full time. I was already like, I was, I was already selling on the side for like a year, year and a half, uh, semi-seriously. Uh, I had started like the mental watches Instagram, but it wasn't super serious, you know? Sure. Uh, and I think in 2015 is when I made the decision to go out and leave and do this full time. Uh, so I've been selling watches for around 10 years now, um, full time for eight years. Uh, and that that's really that's really it. You know, sure. Uh, I realized that, you know, there was a lot of there's a lack of information out there and a lot of people looking for uh sources of information so that they didn't get screwed on buying a watch because people like again we're, we're always coming in these are early days me and wind were collaborating on a lot of stuff like oh that dial's refinished i can't believe that guy doesn't know you know right, and right. no one's really talking about it um and i realized that there's a lot of people who are just you know they don't want to make a mistake and why would you you're spending a lot of money on a watch uh you don't want to buy something bad and i've done it i still do it to this day sure. um but now i try to obviously make sure that none of my clients make mistakes. So I'll make the mistake for you. I'll lose the money for you. So you don't have to, because there's nothing more frustrating than buying a watch from anywhere, whether it's a reputable dealer, whether it's an auction house, whether it's a, a yard sale, um, thinking you have something special and great and awesome. And then realizing a day, a week, a year later, that it's not what you thought it was. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing more heartbreaking than that. Um, you know, and then being in the awkward position of what do you do with it now? How do you sell it? What, you know, so uh, 
I like to tell people I've, I've made all those mistakes. I've lost all that money so that you don't have to, because I offer a lifetime guarantee for all of my watches. So like, if I tell you the, you know, this 1680 red Submariner is all original, original loom, you know, uh, original best and all insert, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if I'm wrong and you don't figure that out for another five years, five years, no problem. Hit me up. I'll take it back. Uh, that's not amazing. mechanical warranty. Yeah. Not obviously not service. People are like, sure. Oh, well, it stopped working after 18 months. I'm like, yeah, it's a watch. It's, it's, it's older than you and I combined, you know, uh, get it service. Sorry. Um, we, we verify that everything's working properly, uh, and, and running well before we sell it. But you know, like Kirill of Lunar Oyster, uh, likes to tell people that he's selling them like a piece of art. He's not selling them oh, a timekeeping device, you know? Right. Right. Cause they're, they're antiques at this point, you know, and there's a lot of people who think that, you know, their watch from 1955 should be keeping time as well as a modern day, whatever. And they just don't get it. Um, but yeah, so that, that's really my origin story. Uh, not, a, not anything sexier than that. Just, uh, obsessed with watches and started selling them, uh, to really, to fund my own collection and it kind of just ballooned. So what's the operation like now? How many people, obviously you mentioned your YouTube videos. So like you're doing that, I, I guess, do you have an editor and filmer and all that stuff or that gentleman is standing right behind us actually right now. He's not listening because he has his headphones in. Uh, we have a full-time videographer, photographer. Uh, I have Jordan who runs operations who you've seen some on some of the videos also, and he does some buying and selling. Uh, and then I have another person in a back room for like more intake stuff and, and some other like loose end photography. Cool. Awesome. Well, I was going to ask you this later, but I mean, I guess now's, uh, you know, no time like the present. Like I, my understanding is like, if I'm in your shoes, margins on watches are four to 9%. I would sure. say, let's call it seven. Right. Right. Close. So, I mean, how, I mean, you, you're, you just got to constantly be buying and selling then. So like, how do you grow your business so quickly to get to a place where, you know, you could start doing the things you're doing. You're obviously in an office space. You, right. You either own that building or you're paying rent. You know what I mean? So the overhead gets nuts. Uh, I'm sure. It's, I'm sure the insurance isn't, you know, cheap. I mean, listen, I'll, I'll break down the numbers for you. Uh, it's, it's actually not as crazy as you think, obviously. So we're actually located in South beach right now. Uh, okay. my rent in a 1300 and change square foot office is like 4,700 bucks a month on South Beach on Lincoln Road, which is super cheap. Wow. But within a few months, we are moving to the design district. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it's like the new uh, best place to be in Miami where all the boutiques are and all the high end shopping is. Um, and my rent is going to literally triple. Oh, wow. Ca yeah, it's a calculated uh, move I've made. Um, it's going to be a much bigger space, much more welcoming. Uh, we're going to have a sign up sheet on the website. We're going to be throwing events there. Uh, sign up sheets to like make appointments to come in, you know, cause right now you just send us an email and, and whatever, we're going to make it a little more streamlined. Cool. Uh, but I, you know, it's taken me, I've been in this building now for eight years, uh, paying this rent and it's great and the location's great. Uh, but I think it was, this is like a significant upgrade and it's taken me eight years to like say, okay, like I could afford to do this and I think it's the right move for my business. Yeah. Insurance is not as crazy. We have uh, our policy is obviously several million dollars. Uh, I think I pay 20 something grand a year. Got it's it. not as crazy as you'd think. Uh, it's not cheap, obviously, but in, 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 in lieu of what, you know, I'm getting insured for, it's, it's not bad. Uh, yeah. although I know it is getting a lot more difficult for new people to the industry, um, and so on to get insured because there's been a lot more stores getting robbed and this and that, and people making claims on watches and jewelry related items. And I know that all these big insurance underwriters have been losing a fortune, uh, uh whether it's theft related or just, you know, because of the market. And I've heard through the grapevine that they're denying a lot of people, a lot of applicants. Uh, you really have to have a tight ship. You have to have been in business for a minute. Uh, your place has to be very, very secure. Like we had somebody come in and they tell us exactly what we need to have to have a certain amount of insurance. And like uh, the, the security is like crazy. There's like a polling thing on my safe that like sends a frequency every goddamn second to the security company. It's wow. it's wild, you know, with like a backup uh, alarm and this and that, you know, with all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, so you have to, you have to, you have to put some money in, in that respect. And when I move to the new office, we're going to be getting an actually even crazier safe. That's going to set me back probably, I don't know, 20, 25 grand. Um, so looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you no, know, yeah. Going back to your original question, uh, margins average out anywhere from like eight to 10%, uh, overall. 
Uh, sometimes we sell at a loss. Sorry, this keeps falling out. Okay. Um, sometimes we sell at a loss. Sometimes we sell break even. Uh, but I think overall, after all said done, it's right around 8% into up to 10% for our business, at least yeah. uh, some retail operations work at much higher margins because they have to, you know, cause their overhead is so much crazier. Uh, I remember, I think European watch co uh, before he moved, Josh was telling me that like it cost them, I forget what the number was, but it was something crazy. It was like something like 10, 20 grand a day just to open doors, something like that. After all is said and done, it was like, what? it's like, how do you do business? Like, that's- right. How do you make a living? It was yeah. some like jaw dropping number. Right. So it, it, I guess it just depends. Everybody structures their business differently. Uh, there's some dealers who are very low volume who just want to hit that home run and, you know, buy a watch for 50 grand and sell it for 85 grand and mm-hmm. every deal be like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are guys like me who I would say I'm more of a hybrid. Obviously, there's certain watches that I get that I'm like, okay, I want to wait for the right buyer for this watch because I think it deserves X price. And there's other watches where it's like, okay, like I just bought this sub for 10 grand. You want it for 10, five, like take it. No problem. You know, sure. Uh, I think it also is a lot different for depending on where you're located. Uh, it's a lot easier to do wholesale and work on smaller margins in the United States than it is, for example, abroad in Japan or, or Europe or, or in a lot of Asian countries because of their customs regulations, their tax regulations and the way they do business. Uh, you know, I know they can't just like flip watches because they took a, a $500 profit on a $10,000 watch. They lose money. Right. After all said and done. Yeah. So it, it just depends. Uh, but yeah, we, we sell, I think on average around a hundred watches a month. Wow. We are, I would say 90% vintage, 10% modern, uh, which is not easy to do because obviously vintage is a lot more niche modern. I know guys who sell 20 watches a day, but they're like a hundred bucks here, 50 bucks there, 200 bucks there. You know, they'll, they're literally buy a $50,000 watch and sell it for 50,350, you know, like it's like, Wow. you know but they do but they do that 10 20 times a day and then money adds up you know yeah. uh it's just a lot it's a lot of work and it's a lot of liability and risk for such small profits but sure. you know they've gotten it down to a science where you know they're able to successfully do it uh notwithstanding changes in the market so like right now there's you know been a correction for the past year especially on the modern stuff where you know a, a fifty-seven eleven that was two hundred grand is now a hundred, you know, and right. imagine having a few of those in your inventory, uh, you're screwed. You know, I know a lot of people. We lost money, but every you couldn't be involved in the watch industry without losing money in the past year. It's just impossible, yeah. unless you're just very stubborn and you refuse to sell at a loss. Right, right. You know, then you have a lot of aged inventory that isn't worth what you paid for it. Yeah, totally. How how close do you follow like the new stuff, like brand new releases and stuff like that? Uh, we follow them. You know, we make every once in a while we make some content about them, uh, resource something for somebody. Uh, I don't follow it as closely as obviously a lot of other people, a lot of, you know, people, uh, bloggers, influencers, et cetera, you know, like uh, clamoring for every new release to make a piece of content about it. Uh, yeah. And I just kind of end up reading about what I'm interested in and what I think is cool. Um, I don't follow it. So it's like, I won't, I can't tell you what like IWC's newest released is, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, tag Hoyer's like latest and greatest, you know, it, unless, uh, I like the watch and I decide to click on that, like Hodinkee or, or revolution article about it. Um, you know, so follow it, but not super intensely. It's funny. IWC just announced a new watch this morning. I saw on Instagram and it's basically, or at least the one I saw was titanium, it's a 41 millimeter chronograph. I think it was titanium. 10 bar uh, water resistance, which is pretty good. Uh, it looks, I don't know what the the bezel's made of, but it's like, it's almost like a an IWC Pilots chronograph mixed with a Daytona and then like a little bit of F1 here and there and then like some Arabic numerals. Okay. It's, I, I can't decide if I like it or despise it. Um, and I am a huge IWC guy. Um, I thought the ingenieur was, was great. Um, totally. And I think they, they totally whiffed on the price, but that's a different story. Yeah. Everybody thinks that. I think, I think the white dial specifically or silver dial or whatever they're calling it. IWC. Oh, my phone fell. Well, I was looking for this. I want to, now you got me interested. I want to see what this new IWC is. Yeah. Um, like Chris Granger posted it. Obviously, their main account posted it. 
I was like, this is definitely going to be a watch that I'm going to need to see in person. Wait, is it, so is it on Instagram? Yeah. Now, now I'm super curious because you can't even find the words to describe it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like this amalgamation of 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 chronographs all in one. I, yeah. I, I don't know what's going on with this watch. At right? least in the context of IWC's like past. Right. And then it's got like the pilot hands, but it's and more like say, a, what are those hands? That's well, yeah, it's got like pilots chronograph hands, but it's like such a car driven design, you know, like automotive. And obviously they sponsor, you know, AMG Patronus and like, the, right. you know, the Lewis Hamilton thing, but like, uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, it was kind of jarring. Yeah. I don't know. I, that's a pass for me. Yeah. And especially with that, um, with the bezel, it's not as, it's not as thick, you know, as like a Daytona. So even like proportion wise, like the, the bezel looks too narrow, but I don't know if that's because we've just been like trained to feel like a bezel should be so wide, you know? Yeah. Well, it's more reminiscent of a Speedmaster bezel, I think, but, mm, uh, yeah. I think they're, I think they're just, it's the bezel part is a little derivative for me. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just it's a little mix of of everything here. I don't think they like had a good direction. But look, at, on the flip side though, I can't imagine being in any of these brand shoes trying to come up with new ideas. Again, mind reading, right? We're back at that. It, it's it's so hard, I think, to come up with fresh new ideas. Sorry, these headphones keep falling out. Let me try changing the sides. I don't really use them. Uh, there we go. So I, I think it's got to be very difficult for them to keep it fresh and interesting and unique. Uh, and I think that's also a big reason why a lot of people have gravitated towards independent watches as of late. Yeah. Cause you're getting these guys who are not focused on producing 50,000 watches or maybe they're producing five, 10, 50, hundred, 500, whatever small batch. Uh, but they're putting their all and their creativity into it, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, everybody knows who follows me. Like I'm a big Simon Brett fan, you know, and you just won a GPHG award for like horological revelation of the year, uh, you know, and it was the first time I saw his watch. I met with him during Watches and Wonders this year. And I didn't, I, I went to introduce a client to some of the brands to help him uh, meet them for collaboration's sake. Uh, and I just happened to get an appointment to meet with him because my buddy Sasha Davidoff's like, oh, you got to meet my friend. Like he has his new watch. Take a look. Yeah. Uh, just 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 to meet him and see the watch, whatever. I went in with zero expectations, knowing nothing what I was going to be looking at. And it was the first watch in a very long time where I was just like, holy shit, this is beautiful, you yeah. know? Um, and, and it knocked my socks off. And But to do something like that, that's like really high-end horology. And it costs mm -hmm. a lot to make. And maybe it doesn't land with such a big audience, you know? Uh, whereas a brand like IWC, they have to sell a certain amount of product. Like mm -hmm. they just have to. So it has to be a design that works for everybody at the right price point that they know they're going to sell units. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, you know, I don't envy their position. I think, you know, while this watch in particular is very strange to me. Yeah. I, I get why they made it, you know? Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of people who find it attractive and will buy it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I didn't know if you saw that or not, but yeah, it was kind of one of those where I was like, Huh. You know, like one of those kind of, I'm not, I, I can't, t I'm going to need to see it in person, you know? Well, cause you're, but you're also looking at it. Like you said, you're a big fan of IWC. So you sure. know, the brand's heritage, you know, all their models, you know, like what represents what in terms of their, their offerings. Like, so for somebody like you who's a fan of the brand, like it right. may not make sense, but to the general public, they're like, Oh, it's a pretty new watch, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think they walk that fine line of, of tailoring watches to clients who, appreciate and love the brand and then bringing in new people and just making a nice watch that's new to sell. Totally. I, um, I have McLaren written down and I don't remember why. So uh, do you own a McLaren? Are you a F1 fan? I did several years ago. Okay. Okay. Maybe that's why. Yeah. I had a 570 S for like a year. It was my first like expensive car. Yeah. It was the one that like really like, uh, I was like, all right, uh, I've made some money. Like I could afford to do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me buy one of these stupid exotic cars, you know? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get on with it? No, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a great intro into the world of exotics. I, I realize now having owned a lot of things that I like, uh, a different era and genre of car a lot more. 
okay. you know, mostly like '90s uh, supercars, if you will, or or even earlier air cooled air cooled Porsches and stuff like that. But I wanted the exotic supercar experience. Sure. Yeah. And so I owned that, and then after I sold that, I bought a Ferrari F12 because I wanted to own a Ferrari. I love that car. Amazing car. Amazing car. But I also realized that when I have automatic cars, I tend to not drive them as much. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, you know, but no, no, I think it was a perfect uh, getting your feet wet into like the exotic supercar category without spending 500 grand on an Aventador. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I don't know. It was like 160,000 at the time, you know? Wow. Uh, I lost, I think I lost like 20 grand on the car, but it was, I got to enjoy it. But you got to drive it. Yeah. Yeah. My cost of ownership was 20 grand for a supercar for a year. Fine. Um, no, it, I, I never had any of like the stereotypical McLaren problems. Uh, it did arrive. I bought it from a McLaren dealership out in California mm. and they said it was just serviced. Everything was great. And I get it. And like service like goes on right away and it needed like a full service. And that was really annoying and they wouldn't refund me the money. Like it was that part was annoying, but it had nothing to wow. do with the car. Yeah. Um, no, but the car, the car was great. Uh, I, I think I enjoy driving McLarens. I, I drove one around a track once. It was great. I've driven a 720S on a test drive. It was great. Uh, nothing really negative to say. Yeah. Well, because I know you're a Ford GT owner, right? Or still? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's a car I don't think I'll ever uh, sell. What color is yours? Silver? Yeah. What uh, What do you like most about it? I think it's the perfect driver's car. It just sucks because I live in Florida and Miami where there's nowhere really to drive it. Um, but it's like one of those cars that like you don't understand how perfect it is until you drive it, you know? Um, you have to like really own it and experience it. And it's just, it does everything right. Uh, everything emotionally it does right. Um, and it's infuriating because like, it goes to show you that like a company like Ford can build a car like that and they just right. choose not to right. <laughs> anymore. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and a lot of other people have driven it. will tell you the same thing. It's like the best driver's car. It's a manual, you know, it's like the end of an era, you know, there's no, no ABS, no, no, no nannies, no nothing. Uh, you know, just V8, three pedals, four wheels. That's it. You know, but yeah. it's the way the car is set up, uh, is just incredible. Oh, that's sick. You mentioned air cooled Porsche. Do you have a favorite kind of model or, or chassis? I don't, uh, cause I like to like try out different things. I've owned almost every generation. Oh, wow. I have a 964 C2 that I actually don't love. Um, it's a great cruiser, uh, but in terms of like performance, not so much. Mm. Uh, I think my G body before was a better car. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I mean, I guess the easy answer is just to say 993 because it was like the most, you know, you know, well-oiled machine, you know, before air cooled went away. Right. You know, and they truly are fantastic cars. I've driven a bunch of them and they all do everything right. Right. But I don't know. It's a good question. I own half of a 912 with my good buddy Marco Geraci of TLG Auto. Oh, okay. We bought a 912 together. Um, and I love that car, but for all the different reasons that you would normally love, like an air cool car. Right. I don't know. I get like it just depends, you know? How did you get to know Marco? Uh, through watches, uh, he's a client and just evolved into like a very, very close friend. Yeah. He, I traded gray and patina dealers out, out your way. Yep. A bunch of watches for a 996 GT3. Oh, uh, I did a YouTube video about it. This is several years back. Uh, Marco like inspected the car for me. Um, and he's also rebuilding right now a 930 that I bought with an Andial 3.4 twin plug and a roof five speed gearbox. Oh uh, I'll send you a picture, dude. The cars, dude, it was, literally was a barn fine car. The car completely rusted with patina, but like beautiful patina, right. you know, and we're leaving the exterior alone. Just going to hot rod it. Um, and so he and I have just, you know, over the years, just become very close with, you know, interests in cars and watches and life. You know, he's, yeah. he's uh, such a, he's a wonderful person. So yeah, uh, never, if you need um... any. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I've never actually met him. Um, he's, I'm, I'm highly interested in having him on the show, obviously, and, and, and getting to know him um, as also just like an utter Porsche fanboy. I used to sell Audis and Porsches like 20 years ago almost. And um, so I was selling them when the 997 was being introduced. So, two, two, so what is that? 2005, late 2004. And um, 
So like the 997.1 specifically is like, it's got like a special place in my heart just cause like those were the models. Right. So that's my um, daily driver. I was going to ask you what your daily driver was. What, uh, what spec 997 do you have? I have a Arctic silver, uh, 997.1 C2S. Amazing. What's the interior black? Black. Yeah. I just wanted, so I bought it, um, Switch cars, Doug Tabbit. I just wanted a uh, quick shout out to him. Uh, just a daily driver, simple, you know. And I wasn't planning on doing anything to the car, but then of course I ended up doing a bunch of mods, like simple aesthetic mods. Um, so OEM plus, as we as we say, exactly, you know. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, so before I was driving, I was daily driving an RS six. I used okay. to sold Audi. Oh, I sold God. the new RS six. Uh, Cause I got one at sticker when they were going for like 30 grand over, you know, somebody did me a favor and got me one at sticker. Rail car for me. Honestly, I liked it. I didn't love it. Well, it's too big. Honestly, an RS four Avant would be the grail for me. Honestly, hundred percent. Yeah. But you know, I was, I'm driving this car every day and then I'm taking my dogs to doggy daycare and they're fucking up the car. I'm taking my kids to the playground and places and they're fucking up the car. And it's like a $130,000 car. Right. And I'm like, why am I, and I'm, not, and, and I'm enjoying the car, but like not so much again, automatic, you know, so I'm like, uh, you know, 12 miles to gallon. <laughs> right. You know, and it was fun, you know, but there's just no, I don't know. There's no passion in that car. Yeah. So I sold that and I bought something for literally like almost a third of the price in a 997 C2S. It was like 50 grand or something like that. You know, how many miles? 40,000. Okay. How many owners? Was it six owners? <laughs> no, it was like a, I think I'm the third owner. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it was a good car. There was like a little bit of paint work on my passenger side dry, dry, passenger side door. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Uh, I don't buy cars to enter into concourse competitions. Right, right, and right. I live in Miami. So like, I always have to assume something bad is going to happen to them. Yeah. Uh, so like a little bit of paint work, some miles, like we're good to go. Just make sure she runs and she looks good and that's it. Uh, now, had that car had that car previously had anything wrong with it? Cause obviously you hear like the, you know, all the chirping online about bore scoring and all this other stuff. And like, have you had any issues with that? Or did you know if it were replaced? I or? haven't personally, uh, right. but I generally try to do as best inspection and buy from people. Like just like people rely on me to understand the condition and, you know, originality of a watch. I rely yeah. on people. I buy cars from to do the same. Uh, and that's why I tend to only buy cars from certain people. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, I personally have never had any issues with anything like that. Uh, what year's your car? Uh, 2007. Okay. That's yeah. The 2005s apparently are like, right. Worst, yeah. And like 2007, you can't do anything about the IMS, like just keep it lubricated, like whatever, you know? Um, but I'm not going to worry about all that shit. And like, at the end of the day, I bought this car with like the strict mindset that like, if something happens to it, don't care. Like this is yeah. like supposed to be my daily driver, like can get dinged around a little bit and I still yeah. take care of it. Like I still care, but sure. like I was parked uh, at a red light and a pickup truck backed into me. He was trying to let somebody cut in front of him and rolled right onto my bumper. And instead of getting an OEM bumper, we got a GT3 bumper, but like it's on the Carfax now, like shit like that, like, yeah. whatever, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. So uh, that car, and that's like the Ford GT you talk about, like that's actually right now up in Connecticut with uh, Matthew Ivanhoe, the Cultivated Collector. Yeah. Because I shipped it up to him because I was like, dude, I'm never, I went like four months without driving the car. I forgot that I fucking had it. And I was like, dude, this is horrible. Because like in Miami, there's just nowhere fun to drive. Like you're worried about somebody hitting you every time you get into the car. Um, people to here do not know how to drive, have no respect. And so I was like, dude, I'm sending you this car. Like I'm going to fly up every like month or so. We're just going to drive it around, you know, because there's nice driving up there. Cool. I sent it up like, six months ago and I, or maybe four or five, six months ago, I still haven't been up, but uh, oh, I was going to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's best sleep. I've been traveling a lot this year, unfortunately. So I haven't had time. Uh, but yeah, so like it is what it is. I'm, I'm kind of over spending a lot of money on cars. Like, cause you yeah. can buy something for little money and have just as much fun, especially sure. if you live in Miami, yeah. you know? So it just depends. Yeah, I'm kind of, you know, it, with my search, I'm not sure what's going to unfold. And and like, you know, if I can't find the perfect color or something, like, could I wrap it? Sure. But do I want to? I don't know. 
Right. Um, I did find a, a good black over tan car that I'm interested in that, that, that could be like a close second, uh, just because I know the owner and I, and I actually spoke to his mechanic and they're all like, yeah, dude, this thing's solid. So 45,000 miles on it, maybe. So, I mean, listen, I think the best decision I kind of ever made with respect to cars was to stop worrying so much about the spec. Yeah. It is important, you know, especially if you're considering resale. Sure. But kind of like for me, it's more about the driving experience and yeah. I stop worrying so much. That's why like I'll buy a silver car. Like you said, if I really care about the car, I'll wrap it, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, you know, I don't know me personally. I'm a guy who gets in and out of cars pretty often like yeah. jordan laughs at me all the fucking time standing behind us like because i'll buy a car and then in like eight months it's gone for something else you know right. um and it's it, i like to treat it like watches you know where you could do that if you do it the right way you know right. Right. um so i i stopped caring so much about spec uh and more of just you know making sure the car is what i think it is you know exactly exactly because i mean it's like it doesn't matter if it looks great if it doesn't run you know <laughs> well i mean like the gt3 for example like my buddy marco uh inspected that car thoroughly it got here it was doing great for the first few months and then all of a sudden i was past a ticking time bomb there's nothing it was a track car before so like the car was sixty five thousand miles like ragged on you know sure um but like Marco went through the car orbit up in Palm beach, which is like the premier like Porsche and they do racing, like everything shop, like best guys in the country for Porsche. Uh, everybody went through that car and then all of a sudden low engine oil pressure and it was holding less than a bar needs a full rebuild. I sold the car, lost a ton of money, but like, oh, man. Uh, you know, the way it was described to me, was like, dude, you just got past the ticking time, Bob. There's unless we took the engine apart, there's no way anybody was ever going to catch this, you know? Yeah. So it is what it is. Yeah. Interesting. You mentioned the Davidoff brothers. How'd you guys get close? Just through watches, obviously, I'm assuming. Yeah, you know, it's funny because they grew up in South Florida and went to a school like not far from me. Like we all had mutual friends, you know, like a, a school that actually I live right down the street from now, but like we all like partied together and stuff. We never crossed paths. Um, and it's funny because I used to not like them, especially when I first got started in the business. When I first got started in business, one of an early transaction. We're talking literally like a decade ago. Um, I sold them a Speedmaster. I sold Roy a Speedmaster. And he was like, yeah, I'll have Sasha wire you when I get back to Geneva. I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'm trying to be cool. You know, I don't have a lot of money. This is like six grand though. I'm like, try, yeah, no problem. Pay me when you get home. Like, you know, just take it easy. All right. Like relax. And I get home and like a week goes by, two oh, weeks shit. go by. Like, Hey man, <laughs> like, can I get paid on this invoice, please? And Rose like, oh yeah, Sasha's Sasha will do it when he gets back. He's just up in the mountains right now. And like, I look at his Instagram and he's like at a fucking nightclub in, in Geneva, you know, like, <laughs> so I'm like, fuck these guys, you know, and they paid me. It was a problem. And so then we didn't really speak. You know, I, I didn't say anything bad about them. I just wasn't a huge fan. Right. I'm in New York for some auction. Uh, Might've been Paul Newman, Paul Newman sale. I don't remember. Anyways, it was, you know, six, seven years ago. And I'm walking around with Sasha and Josh Ganji of European Watch. And Josh is like, dude, I don't understand how you guys are not like best friends. You guys are like the same fucking person. And <laughs> we just started hanging out and, you know, became close. That's funny. Um, as far as dealers go, you know, they say buy the dealer. Um, it's, it's almost sort of become like dating in a way. Like if you're a consumer, because you're now, you're like, okay, well you know, Adam's cool. Roy's cool. Like whoever's, they're all cool. Eric Wynn's cool. Like whatever. It's kind of like, right. How, how do you, I guess let's just put it like, let's put it this way. How are you different? Like in, you know, like how, how do you get the client at the end of the day, I guess? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, it doesn't matter what your relationship is with somebody. I mean, listen, I have some clients that like will only buy from me. And even yeah. if they're interested in somebody else's watch, they'll make me do the deal for uh, them because they cool. trust me. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, like if Kirill or Andrew Shear or Eric who have a watch in stock that you want that I don't have, you're going to go buy it from them. So it doesn't right. matter. Right. Uh, but I think in terms of like repeat business, it all boils down to the relationship and it's a combination of many things, you know, first and foremost, answering your fucking phone. There's so many dealers who just like refuse to get back to people. And I get it. Like if you look at my phone right now, I'm going to end this podcast and I'm going to have a hundred missed messages. I'm really? part of all these. Oh yeah. It's, 
it's absolutely crazy because I have all these WhatsApp chats, dealer chats now, collector chat, messages on Instagram, emails, IMS. It's nuts, you know, and people don't realize the extent of that. Like one day I really should just film my phone, you know, for like an hour. And people can see just how crazy it is. My wife goes nuts because I'm on my phone all day, you know, it's just, and it's from every different time zone, whatever. So anyways, first and foremost, answering people timely, uh, I think is important, which a lot of people fail to do. And sometimes it's purposely, sometimes it's just messages fall through the cracks, you know? Um, uh, I think it's also a very much a, a trust factor in terms of like, did that first couple deals go smoothly? Uh, on the flip side, like when you go to sell the watch, like were you able to get out of it easily? Like, was it represented and, and was it what you thought it was? No, I'm not saying like, in terms of like the money aspect of it, like if I sell you a watch for 10 grand, the market value is 10 grand and the market goes down to five, like you lose five grand. Like, some people might blame the dealer, but other, most people recognize like, hey, it's just the market. You know, when the market goes down, like shit. If I show you my safe right now, like, <laughs> I, we all we're all taking losses when the market goes down. It's you're you're totally. not alone as a collector. You know, yeah. Um, most people understand that. Some don't. Some just you know because they have that bad taste in their mouth. Because like, oh, I bought the watch from Adam and I lost five grand. Like, okay, <laughs> if I could cry to every person I lost money from. But anyways, I think it's also very much like a personality thing. You know, a lot of people gravitate towards you know Eric Wynn, for example, because he has that like very you know white collar uh, proper you know scholarly you know attitude you know very wholesome uh i'm not that guy obviously he and i are close friends and i think it's a very much good yin and yang um uh because i i speak my mind you know i i talk a lot uh i don't bullshit uh i call it how it is i dress the way i want like i don't care what people right. think of me um and so i think a lot of it is uh you know just the way you know you conduct yourself and whether you gel with that personality like krill for example he has one of the biggest collectors in the United States is, is, is like his best client. Like guys got insane stuff, cars and watches, like just like jaw dropping, like dream. It's like every man's dream. But anyways, yeah. uh, guy's a great guy, but he's very serious and to the point and like no time for bullshit. And that is Kirill in a nutshell. Kirill will not be your friend. Like you want to chit chat about the watch and joke around, like he'll do it for like the first two minutes. And then after that, it's like, do you want to buy the watch or not? Yeah. If not, I got shit to do. Why? You know, um, and that's curly. It's very straight, professional to the point. You know, um, and so they gel very well together because that's that guy's like that as well. You know, he doesn't yeah. have time to waste. Uh, so I think it's just very much like you said. It's like a it's like a love affair. Like who do you you know gravitate towards the you know the most in terms of the personality, and then obviously, but uh, none of that matters if the watches suck. So like first and foremost, do you have the right inventory? Uh, are your watches good? Yeah. Yeah, totally. What's the Grail car? I mean, you've had some solid stuff. So I've had some. I like to say that I've owned my two Grail cars. You know, the nine nine three GT, uh, the nine nine three RS, um, and the four GT. Yeah. Uh, and like, there are obviously way more cars that are way more expensive that I would love to own. But like for me, those are my two Grail cars. Like growing up, you know, and throughout the years, and I'm fortunate enough to have owned them. Uh, probably, I guess nine nine three GT two, uh, three hundred SL. Uh, other random stuff. I, I really like to own an RS 200 at some point. Uh, a lot of random shit, you know. Yeah. But yeah, just yeah. because they're more expensive doesn't make, necessarily make it more exciting to me. Right. Uh, you know, uh, money kind of like. Sometimes there's like cars that are like go for millions of dollars, and I'm like, why? Like, right, that right. probably sucks to drive, you know. Well, and also like, how do you look at ownership? Like when something is so expensive, like. Are you nervous about it or are you like, screw it, um, it's just money and I'll, you can always make more money, but they're not making more of these cars. You right, know? right. Yeah, it's like uh, McLaren F1 or whatever, you know, like you can't, uh, you can't drive that, you know? Right. <laughs> you can't, you know? What are those now, 30, 40 million? Like, I don't know, what are those? Last time I checked, they were like 18 to 20. Um, okay, okay. I'm sure they are now. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't, I don't keep tabs just cause yeah, like, it's just so to. out of reach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just so out of reach. Like even if I had, I mean, listen, if I was worth $500 million, I'm like, all right, fuck it. Like whatever, you know, it's not like it's losing money. Um, but it's just so unrealistic for me, you know, that yeah. like, I don't, I, I tend to not pay attention to stuff that's just like way too unrealistic. Like I'll, I'll take an interest in terms of like on the periphery, just like, you know, yeah, that's cool. We'll read about it a little bit, but like, I'm not going to get like obsessed with it. Cause I know yeah. it's just, I'd rather stay focused on what I think is attainable for me right now. Maybe in the future it will be, but for right now, I'd like to stay focused on like, you know, the goal I have in front of me, 
you know, that's, that's it's like kinda, I set a goal to own that 4 GT. I got it. You know what I'm saying? Like move on to the next. Totally. Yeah. That's kind of how I've sort of like roped my emotional attachment and or financial interest in certain watches. It's just kind of like, right. okay, I think I found the sweet spot of like what I'm willing to pay right. that I can afford, enjoy and continue to wear. And it's not like, oh my God, if my wife found out how much this cost, like, <laughs> it would be like you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think a lot of with watch collecting too, it's similar to cars where you could buy a watch in almost any price point and enjoy it just as much as you would something way more expensive. Yeah. Uh, you know, sure, you might not get the same satisfaction or, or whatever. You're not going to get the same applause from a group of watch collectors or, you know, who knows, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that you can't, you know, like I'll, I'll wear this guy here. And have a great yeah. time doing it, you know, sure. a $400 yeah. Blanc Pond swatch, you know. Right. Uh, and I think like with cars, but more so with watches, if you do it right and you buy right uh, and you take your time, you research and you buy from somebody that you trust or whatever that knows what they're doing. Uh, you know, I, I'm not using the word investment because they're not, but right. it's a good store of funds. Like if you buy a 1016 Explorer for, let's say, $12,000, assuming you know, nothing in the world has gone, we're not in World War III because then we're all fucked anyways. But assuming, yeah. you know, market fluctuations, whatever, that watch should fluctuate at no more than 10 to 15%. So right. let's say 10% drop, you know, you know, you're down to a little over 10 grand. You sell it three years later. You know, it's a good store of money. You know, you lost a little bit, sure, but like you got to wear you it also, for years. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, your cost of ownership's next to nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, I think it's just a matter of perspective. You know, if you go walk into a store and buy a brand new Hublot or whatever, you know, for 50 grand, you walk out the store, a guy like me is offering you, you know, 25 cents of the dollar, 30 cents of the dollar. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it was right. like the same with cars and in, in pre COVID times, like you went and bought a, a brand new Huracan or whatever, a Lamborghini, whatever you want, you drove off the lot, you lost 30% right away. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, people forgot what that was like, you know, with watches and cars, people forgot. Yeah. They for, it's been like four years and people have straight up forgot that like the normal modus operandi of like buying a watch or a car was you expected to lose some money, you know, uh, it just whatever your tolerance threshold was for that loss. Yeah. Uh, and now, cause now everybody, it's, it's a big problem with watch uh, collecting and, and watch buyers. And luckily a lot of the speculators are getting kicked out of the market, but it's been a problem for the past few years where everybody like just expects to at the very least break even. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, and most of the times they want to make money on every purchase they make. And it's like, well, yeah, it's, it does, it doesn't work that way. It's interesting too, like with regards to just like how I wear watches, because I don't know, I live in Southern California. I have a pool. Like I like to just jump in the pool, you know, or like whatever. And it's just kind of like there's a lot of certain watches, say like a, a vintage Royal Oak versus a, a new one. Like I'm gonna swim in a new one. I'm not gonna swim in one from the '70s. You know what I mean? So it's like, and can they be found for the same price? Yeah. Do they look a little different? Absolutely. But it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll steer more towards a, a modern piece than an old piece, literally for that reason and that reason only. You know, so, I mean, it's just kind of like, how are you using the product too at the end of the day, I guess? Sure. Yeah. It, it's, it all depends on what your prerogative is. I, I yeah. think absolutely, you know? Um, you know, we get a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I, I, I need to swim, be able to swim my vintage watch. And I'm like, well, listen, I could change the gaskets. I could have it pressure tested. I could do everything within my power to make sure it is waterproof as possible to use your example. Uh, yeah. but there's no guarantees in life. And like, I've had clients, I had a client who had a brand new 5711, like literally walked out of the boutique with a brand new 5711 within a few weeks, he didn't screw down his crown all the way. And his oh. girlfriend pushed him in the pool and the watch got flooded. You know, and it's like, so that could happen on a vintage or a modern watch, you know, totally. uh, obviously much less likely to happen on a modern watch. Uh, and at least with a modern watch, like you go diving with, you know, whatever your new IWC perpetual, whatever the fuck, um, <laughs> they could, they could fix it. They have the parts, you know, it could be fixed uh, with, you know, this 18239, you know, with this beautiful patina dial, if this gets flooded, like I'm not going to get this dial again. Like I'll put a regular yeah. silver dial in it, but that's it, you know? Uh, like that patina is gone or, you know, like 1680 with beautiful patina. Like you're not, you're not going to, you can't, some of these parts are irreplaceable in terms of vintage yeah. watches, you know? And that's why I usually advise people against swimming with watches, uh, you know, just to go back to that, just because, uh, you can't rectify a problem once it's already happened, you know, yeah. most of the times. 
With some of these market corrections and such, let's use that 1680 as an example. What is the market on that right now? Okay, so great example. And it's a, it's a white, not a red, obviously. So I have two here. Uh, there is one that... Oh, where is it? Like that. A red 1680 would be my Grail Submariner, by the way, I think. No, oh, well, when you're ready, we'll have to find you one, good sir. So yeah. I don't I don't know where the watch is in front of me. I may have put it back in the safe, but I bought two 1680 whites, for example. There's one on your wrist? Oh, Fucking hell. <laughs> it is the one the one I wanted to talk about was on my wrist. I because you took the AP off, obviously. So <laughs> I paid, I have the invoice sitting right in front of me. I paid ninety six fifty for this watch. Now oh, wow. this watch has a perfect yellow patina dial. Beautiful. It has an unpolished case, uh, beautiful bezel, really strong example. A uh, little bit of little cracking in the loom on the minute hand, but overall, like stud example, really, really nice example. I put it up in my WhatsApp collector chat in the sales portion for $10,500. Now, this is a watch that I probably would have asked 13, five to 14 uh, a year, year and a half ago. If it has to go to my site, I'll probably list it for like 12, 12, five. Um, in, in the WhatsApp chat, I'm trying to give people like more wholesale quick deals. Well, sure. Yeah. You know, uh, trying to, you know, give these people like first early access to stuff. Uh, so, I would say the market's corrected in the 10 to 20% range, you know, and that goes for most four digit, uh, steel sports watches for Rolex. Um, it's not like, uh, here right in front of me also five, four or two, a, I have a five, four or two, a mint a series. Uh, it's listed on my website. I think for like $97,500, this watch a year and a half ago, I would have been asking one fifty, and I would have gotten that or somewhere close to it, you know? So we're talking like a 33% drop in a big one. You know, yeah. uh, Rolex is generally more stable than that just because there's more of it. It's more commoditized. Uh, so, you know, Royal Oaks Nautilus is they, they skyrocketed because they were the biggest hype pieces, you know, uh, everybody celebrity celebrity and every Tom, Dick and Harry wanted them and was buying them. So they, they crashed the most, um, overall in the market. It just depends on the watch and the model, but there's been corrections anywhere from like 10 to 50%. You know, it's, it's been, it's been, uh, up and down you know things have kind of leveled off now uh for quite some time but there was some serious drops so the event you went to this morning call it a trade show what have you an event with a japanese dealer i'm assuming what what compels that person to sell that 1680 at 95 9600 bucks then uh because he's got he's a wholesaler only does business dealer to dealer so he knows he has to leave room for somebody yeah, else sure. uh and they also have hundreds and hundreds of watches. So okay. they're they're working off of limited margins, but they're selling volume. You know, yep. I bought five watches from them. Right. Uh, and then there's other people buying six or two or 10, you know? So uh, they're not looking for that retail client. You know, this watch also, the, the crystal has some nice scratches on it. I'm going to make sure it's running well, service, et cetera. Uh, so they're not doing all of that. They just want to make a quick uh, flip and move on with themselves, uh, yeah. all with their lives. They're strictly wholesalers. Like you cannot find the, a website for these people. You know, you can't. Uh, go visit them at their store or whatever. It's, you know, they only that, work with other dealers. Yeah, sure. Now, does that piece specifically, just again, using that as the example, does, is, are these typically coming box papers or no, just naked? No, most, most vintage stuff you don't find with box and papers just because if you're yeah. talking about Rolex in particularly, uh, particular, the warranty was only good for a year or two. So most people are like, oh, I don't need this anymore. Or they moved houses or it got sold. Yeah. They couldn't find the box and papers. Uh, and no one would have thought in the 60s, 70s, what have you, that keeping that box and papers would have been such an important thing to do in terms of the value of the watch. Cause these right. watches were worth fucking nothing. Right. Nobody right. cared about it. So uh, you generally find, I would say 10% of examples of box and papers, uh, which also by the way, can be doctored, you know? So uh, you really need to be careful and make sure what you're buying is actually the original box papers, because you know, if this watch is 10,000 naked, but it's 15,000 with box and papers, it you know incentivizes somebody to take those papers to mm -hmm. make a little bit of extra money. Uh, so, but generally, I would say ninety percent of the watches, maybe even more, uh, are without box and papers, and it's not anything nefarious. It's just they've been lost to the ether of time. You know. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, dude, that's all I got for you, really, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. This is really fun, very insightful. I'll say. Um, I really appreciate you being candid. Um, and even just like with the numbers and stuff, that was really cool. Um, yeah, of course, man.
Is there anything listen, else you want to promote? No, it's no great secret. And and I always tell people, listen, like uh, my clients understand, at least I'd like to think that my clients and the guys who are close to me and buy from me repeatedly like to understand. Uh, I, I think like to think they understand that they know how the way the world works, that I need right. to make money to keep this the doors open and pay my employees and you know put food on my table. And I'm going to make a profit on the watch. Like I can't just sell them right. at my cost, you know? Right. Uh, so obviously there's, you know, limitations to that and, and being reasonable, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, the people who don't understand that, like, you know, are like, God forbid a dealer should make money. I don't care. I, you, I don't need to sell you a watch anyway. So yeah. uh, I'm always happy to be candid and upfront. Like I just released a YouTube video that literally shows me inspecting the watches pre-auction, shows me buying the watches at auction, and then shows the prices that I paid for them in auction. And you right. guys know I'm going to resell them for more money. Like, so you see exactly what I paid. Like, you're going to yeah. know my margin because you saw what I fucking paid. Uh, so I don't really care. If somebody doesn't want to accept that, you know, uh, God forbid I should make a, a living, then they don't have to buy from me. They can buy a watch elsewhere. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, listen, dude, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, man, thanks for stoked having me. For, uh, stoked for the new move for you uh, to the design district. You when when to, do you uh, think that'll... Yeah, I'd love so, to. The lease takes, uh, well, we haven't even signed the lease yet because lawyers are going back and forth, but uh, the lease takes effect January. We'll probably move in February because we have a lot going on in January with the Miami Beach Antique Show and all that stuff. Yeah. So probably in February. And we're going to start trying to do like either every month or every other month like events there for collectors because there's no really uh, Miami group of collectors that get together. We're going to try to change that. Oh, cool. Um, so nice. yeah, I'll keep you in the loop. Yeah, please do. Love to come see you. And then, of course, I've got a couple clients there too. So, uh, yeah, come cool. down for the antique show. It's a great time to come. It's 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 one of the most fun like watch related events I think uh, that's put on every year. Okay. And cool. uh, the Friday night, Kirill, Sasha, and I put on um, uh, uh, get get together at night, uh, which we're going to host at Walk Race Vintage this year. So you know where I list some of my watches for sale. Uh, you know they're a big car guitar place. They sell all Porsches, vintage Porsches. Uh, so that'll be fun. And then uh, Alfredo Paramico messaged me about doing like a more intimate, uh, like neo vintage uh, kind of like sit down. Yeah. Some collectors, you know, um, so that'll probably happen too. And then you just get to walk around during the antique show, which is a blast because there's so many different vendors there. It's a lot yeah. of fun. Oh man, I would love to. All right. Adam, well, dude, thank thanks you, for brother. having me and uh, yeah. let me know when it comes before it comes out so I can promote it. For sure. Thank you All so right. much, man. Okay. Chat soon. This wraps up this episode of the Standard Age Podcast. If you like what you heard, I'd love it if you'd share it with a friend or two. And if you have a moment, please rate and review the show as it helps others discover these episodes. It absolutely helps far more than you realize. Shout out to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme track. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.